Okay, and uh, we are live. So, hello to everyone. I am Fra. And uh, this is the first video that I actually doing on the subject. So, today we are gonna look at uh, the new project that I'm trying to work on. And uh, we can read a very quick and dirty kind of overview that I created. Um, yeah, so so I'm actually going to work on a new object detection model. So I want to create a new object detection model that is good, is competitive with all the other uh, detection models that you can see, like YOLO, YOLO you know, V5, V7, V8, whatever. Uh, but the main focus will be to something that is quick to train, easy to fine tune, and easy to develop. So let's start by reading the document here. Let me also remove OBS. Okay. So yeah, goal of motivation. The goal of this repo is not to create the best uh, developer friendly. Okay, so <laughs> this is a typo. So the goal of this repo is not to create the best model, but to create the best developer friendly object detection model. So instead of focusing on a family of different size models, I aim to train one middle size one, so between 80 million and 100 million parameters, and provide quantized smaller models using different techniques using this model, this, uh, this medium size model. The main key points are incorporate the latest techniques and target from research in the community. Pro provide state-of-the-art performance on various, on various subject detection tasks. Designed to be fast and efficient, this is a very important one with a focus on a need to use and flexibility. Easy to export to Onyx for, the, for deployment on different kind of platforms and fast data loading for efficient in training and evaluation. This is an also very important one because if your model is not really big, um, you are going to be bottleneck by the speed that you can provide data to the GPU, right? Then this is a very, uh, very, let's say, uh, interesting uh, statement that, that I'm making. So SOTA means nothing. So SOTA on common data set such as COCO means nothing. And why is that? It's because all this big, and now it's 2023, this data set are kind of old, uh, these data sets are full of mistakes, right? They're full of weird stuff. So if we, I guess, we should uh, Coco Robo Flow. If we look, uh, what the, let's say, uh, ta, 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 ta. okay. So if we have a look at one article that we created when I was working on Robo Flow. We can actually see, yeah, so let's go to images. So we can actually see that on Coco, there are kind of weird, weird stuff inside it. So like this is an image that is on Coco. And yeah, it's, it's low. So yeah, as you can see here, this, there is a black and white image of Stalin that is trying to eat a hot dog man. Then let me open in a new window. Come on, Google. Yeah, okay, it's kind of slow, but the catch uh, here is that all these data set co contains weird things, as you can see here, here, etc., etc. So if you have a higher MIP on Coco, it may mean that your model is more wrong, so it's able to fit the data set better. Yeah, wow. What I will focus on is to ensure the model has competitive performance on the most used research, research dataset and real life ones. So I want to have a model that works fairly good in all kinds of datasets. And the model has to be fast and easy to fine tune. So a lot of models that you find around, uh, they were created by trying to optimize the test set of a specific data set to obtain SOTA and you know create a publication. This means that when you try to fine tune that model with the given hyper parameters that you know the uh, 
the creator of that model provides to you, you may are going to have some issues like maybe your loss is going to explode, etc. etc. Because most of the models are not made with the goal of be used to fine tune, they are made with the goal of obtain SOTA and create a publication. Now, so let's see at the current limitation that you know all that the models more or less have. So usually they have slow data loading. If you're developing PyTorch, you know you are, you are creating a dataset class, and then you are passing this dataset class to a data loader, and data loader will spawn different processors, and each one of them will create what you return inside the get item function from the dataset class. It means that if you're reading a lot of files and you are doing data augmentation on the dataset class, you are going to do everything one by one. And Py Python is terrible with, with threads, so you know it's going to be slow by default. And then it means that you are going to do data augmentation on each individual piece of data. So you're going to open an image with OpenCV and Pillow, and then you're going to do the add augmentation there. And that's slow. It's way faster to just load the images as tensor to batch them together. So maybe you need to pad and then do the data augmentation, you know, on a single batch, either on CPU or if you have one on GPU. Then usually there is a lot of spaghetti code, you know, uh, so code that is very hard to use, understand. Usually you also have custom post-processing function like the non-max uh, suppression. And usually what I've seen around is that people do not use the default non-max suppression from PyTorch that is exportable to Onyx, but they do some kind of weird tricks, you know, always to, uh, to optimize the model for the test set of Coco, for example. And then, you know, I, I want to have the pre-processing, the model and the post-processing part to be exportable to Onyx. So then you get one Onyx file and the only thing that you need to do is to feed an image inside and you get back a tensor with the bounding boxes. Usually also weak baseline models are used. So usually people use a backbone I don't know, a VAT, a RASNet, or something similar that was portrayed only on ImageNet and then they train it on Coco. So what's the issue there is that the capability of that backbone is very, is very low. What I want to do is use the backbone from Clip. So the VAT uh, model trained using Clip. The, the cool thing is that, you know, we all know that that model is capable of representing a lot, you know, a lot of different images from different domains and is able to create a very good embedding, right? So what I want to do is I take the clip model, I freeze it, right? Because I know it's going to be already so good, right? And then basically I train the neck and the head. And then I also want to experiment in by, okay, I freeze in the backbone, so I'm not gonna train that, I'm not gonna uh, compute the gradient for that, so like the, the train routine will be very, very fast because probably the neck and the head will have around five million parameters max. And then maybe I also want to be able to fine tune the VAT clip backbone, but I'm gonna do that using LoRa. That is a technique that basically injects some small weights in some specific part of the backbone. So in VAT will be, I guess, on the keys and values of the attention block. And so, you know, you don't need to train the whole thing. You just need to train a very small subset of weights that is usually is around 1% of the total number of weights. Then we, you know, usually models have the anchor boxes, that is an engineering bias that you basically uh, inject in the architecture in which you end up with some features, you know, that are on a grid, so like, you know, uh, features in 3D, so channels and height and width. And in each grid, you, as you, you associate free, free anchor boxes that are basically three boxes that you think are, you know, more or less 
similar to the bounding boxes that you will encounter in the in the data set like from the shape maybe a rectangular maybe a tall and big one etc and you predict the offset of and you predict the offset from that anchor box right this has this usually is not done anymore because you know you you need to have a little bit of um, engineering to be able to to estimate the anchor boxes for your data sets and yeah so i don't want to do that another thing is that usually all these models you know except for i guess yellow v8 and yellow v5 they are poorly packaged it means it's hard to run them right uh, so i just want to have a good way to install them so providing the, the docker file so you can just pull an image and run it and uh, yeah basically that's the whole point right i want to have good package models uh, and i want to have only the dependencies i need then bad documentation i think that the tetron 2 doc, i mean the tetron 2 is an amazing project you know it's very old now uh, but the documentation can, can be really improved so i want to have clear and easy to use documentation and usually most of the uh, heavy lifting in avoiding writing a lot of doc is to have strong types you know python has, has is not a type it, uh language but you can have type hints so if i have cool type hints it means i don't have to explain what you need to pass to each parameter because the types is there and i can just explain that in a doc string uh, yeah, and then they are made by seeds. <laughs> so the big plan of attack is I want to get something ready to train as soon as possible while keeping the design extensible. Sorry for the typo. It means that I want to be able, you know, to have some code base that maybe is a little bit not, not so polished, but I want to, you know, have a good, uh, good foundation that if I want to change the head, change the backbone, do some, some stuff in the future, I don't have to rewrite the whole thing. Then I want to focus on the data pipeline, so I want to be able to get all the images, create a tensor with all the images, and map, and map, map to memory, so I store the tensor to disk, and map, map it to memory, so then it's more efficient to, to read it. And then I want to do the, the, the augmentation on basis of CPU. I hope, since I'm using Clip, uh, since I'm using the Clip image encoder, so the VAT train with Clip, I won't be need to do a lot of augmentations uh, because Clip has seen 400 million images. So it should already be very good. And then I want to do a very quick but meaningful hyperparameters exploration. So, the most important hyperparameter there would be the learning rate and how you warm up it, right? So something quick and meaningful, you know, to be able to find something that will work well. And then I want to train on something big. So either the, 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 the object 365 data set that is bigger than Coco or the data set proposed in Florence, that is a big model. But uh, I result to the, the, the editors. Of Florence, but you know they haven't replied to me. Uh, yeah, as I said, I want to be everything in Sport One X, and I want to provide a uh, developer-friendly uh, solution. So here are links so, some papers that I think are very relevant to this. So this is a very interesting one. So in this paper, basically, they try to see what would be the easiest way to create an object detector model using a plain vision transformer, so like the normal VAT. So what they f find out is that, so let me find, okay. So this is usually what is done with convolution models that at each stage you have increased number of channels and lower uh, spatial size. And then you, 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 you keep in memory uh, each middle feature you feed it to a feature pyramid network and the goal of the FBN is to create a list of refined features with the same uh, feature size, so with the same number of channels. Here you can see that for each block in the FBN I need to have in memory the previous stage and the feature from the previous FBN block. So I need to keep in memory quite a lot of stuff. 
So they also explore, hey, what if? So since VAT, a normal VAT do, do, does not uh, decrease the spatial size, maybe I can just use the last feature, right? And this actually work quite well. So I don't need to store in memory all these features here. I just need to store the, la the latest one. So I can freeze the whole thing and just keep the latest one. And then oh, they also try, okay, do I need to have um, the, uh, do I need to use the feature from the layer before? No, I actually don't. So this is super easy to implement and it's super cheap to run because I don't need to store all these intermediate things. And if you look at the gradients, you know, I if I go into do a gradient update here, I don't need to go back and change this as well. So now all these are independent. They also did a bunch of tricks to handle big, big images, but there are tricks that you can just had to the VAT, you don't need to retrain it. And then if the SEG former paper, basically the only interesting thing that is relevant to this is that we can drop the positional embedding. So the positional embedding is a fixed size tensor based on the image size that you train on that is learned during training and it gives the model the ability to understand in which position each token was. Uh, this is actually not great uh, for visual models because maybe you want to fine tune on a different size or maybe you have a model already trained on a specific size like on ImageNet 224 times 224 and you want to retrain it on a bigger size and then you will need to interpolate the positional embeddings that will make you lose some uh, precision or you need like to, to retrain the positional embedding from scratch. So like would be way, way much better if we can just add a, a depth-wise one times one convolution with zero padding in between the, the MLP after the attention block. And maybe I, you know, I can still, I, I can drop the positional embeddings. I can inject that new weight there and I can just, you know, freeze the old model and train only that specific part. So then I will have a VAT that is still the one from clip, but without the need for positional embeddings. This is super, super nice paper. So in this paper, they show you how to change the loss function that is usually used for object detection in order to drop the no max suppression. And what you will end up doing is something similar to the ATR, which are the queries that are coming into the uh, transformer decoder block and then you match with the, with the ground through pounding boxes in order to find their error match and compute the loss. But here we are doing with CNNs. So, I'm oh, sorry. So here the idea, the idea is instead of, where is the nice picture? Uh, then they had a nice picture. I think this is, should, should go on GitHub, GitHub. So here the idea is instead of a uh, uh, new window, instead of predicting the center of a bounding box using a grid, right? So here for each child, we're gonna predict the center of a bounding box, right? The point closer to the center of the, yeah, okay. And this is, uh, this is like in center net on the F cost and I think in yellow gate as well. And now the issue is that while you're computing the loss here, the only thing that you, uh, you know, that you use is the location cost of point distance. So how much, uh, this point, you know, is close to the, to the, um, to the right bounding box. Uh, yeah, but here they say, okay, we should instead drop the grid idea and we should try we should try to predict um the uh, it's really hard to explain like instead of just focusing on the location you should also focus on the classification so they change the matching cost you know be able to uh, assign you know to, to be able to find a match between the, the predicted bounding box and the real ones so i can find that a match and that's usually done, you know, by looking at which box is overlapping the most with the, with the ground rule and then I can use them and I can compute the, the, the last function to penalize the model uh, if I made a bad prediction with that box. Uh, here they also use the classification cost. 
So here on this grid, we want to find the, the point that makes more sense for the object that we want to look. So here in this case, probably this part is going to be the most descriptive part for this human compared to here. And, you know, we also want to be able to still pre predict the offsets for a bounding box. So the end prediction here will be the offsets from this bounding box here. And they also have a very good examples in the paper. So if we go in the paper, we can see some images of a giraffe. So the blue is the normal grid pre prediction. And the issue is that, you know, we are predicting the, the center, right, of that, that bounding box. So here in this example, the bounding box is maybe something like, like this, so the center is in the background. But if we try to predict the location and the classification at the same time, then we are going to find a point that makes sense for this, uh, this object here. So here we want to focus on the neck of the giraffe. Uh, yeah, and the good thing is that then you don't need the Nomax uh, suppression anymore because this is so much better. Uh, yeah, so I want to use this, right? And uh, yeah, so uh, this is the clip paper, this is the LoRa paper, this is the TensorDit uh, project that is uh, thinking Python, that is it's very cool. Basically, you can create a, a, a dictionary of tensors, they need to have the same batch dimension. Uh, so in this case, you are specified three and four, so they need to have the first two, you know, they need to be equal. And then you can basically do all tensor operation directly on the dictionary. So if I want to, I think we have a reshape. If I want to reshape something, um, I can just go ahead and do in the tensor lit. But the most interesting feature is that I can, I don't think it's shown here, but if I go here and I go to the static, maybe, oh, where the hell is that? Templates, uh, nope, uh, reference, uh, tutorials. Uh, where the, <laughs> sorry guys. Um, yeah, t tutorials, here we go. Uh, here we go, yeah. So what you can do here, this is a tutorial on ImageNet, is that I can just go ahead and uh, skip that, skip that, skip that. Yeah, I can create a tensor did. That this, this is a tensor cloud, it's a tensor did, where I have image and targets. And then I created a memmap tensor, you know, and the story to disk. So when I want to read it, you know, I'm gonna read the file the first time, it's gonna to be memmap to memory. So every time I need to reread it, I will always read from the same memory part right, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it means that I just need one processor. It means that if I really want to, since this is using NumPy under the hood, I can read my files with Rust or C++ and create the NumPy file, and then I read it a map up to, uh, to a tensor class, tensor here. And then it means that if we see this collat function that is called when we load in the data loader, I can basically do the transformation directly on a batch of images on GPU. The only drawback is that like you basically need to re-implement the transformation. And here there are some transformation re-implemented, but this is fairly easy to do if you go ahead and use GPT-4 for it. And it's easy to test it because then and you can see the images, right? Yeah, so like this is, an overview of the whole project. I start to call some random stuff. Uh, this is, you know, just very not polished. Uh, you know, I'm on a branch here, but I'm just doing everything on this branch. I don't know why. And uh, yeah, so in the next videos, I'm gonna continue the development. Uh, it will be like some sort of a diary, right? To how I'm coding these, uh, um, the results, the issues and trouble. Yeah, so cool and see you on the next one. Ciao.